Well, good morning to all the people who got up when their alarms went off this morning, right? Hey, it's good to see you guys. Uh, if you are a guest or you're visiting for the very first time, welcome. My name's Matt. I'm one of the pastors around here. And, and if you're up for it, I would love to get to meet you. I'll be hanging out in the lobby afterwards. If you're cool with it, just come up and introduce yourself. If not, if not, you're not ready for that, that's totally fine. We'd love to have you back whenever you're ready. I'd love to meet you. Uh, and if you haven't been here before or you've missed the last couple of weeks, Rick and I have been bouncing back on this fourth that we're calling, uh, this series what we're calling When Pigs Fly. And, and what we're doing is we're looking at these different miracles that Jesus performed. These miracles that maybe on the surface level, Probably there's a greater probability of pigs flying than these things actually happening. But we're not looking at these different miracles and just saying, wow, that's really cool and that's about it. No, we're looking at them because there's actually application for us today. Like how do we respond to what Jesus did then and what he's doing right now? That's the purpose of this, this series. Last week we looked at these guys, that, these four guys that they lowered their friend who was paralyzed. They wrecked a hole in a roof. They lowered him down to Jesus in order for him to meet Jesus. And we talked about what does it look like for us as a church because we want to wreck as many roofs as possible just to get as many people as we can to Jesus. So that's the two-minute version of the five weeks that we've been in so far. If you got a Bible with you today, go ahead and open it up to Mark chapter 4. That's where we're going to hang out, Mark 4. And, and while you're flipping there, let me tell you this. Every single week, I, I want you to bring your Bible with you for, for two different reasons. Number one, I want you to see that I'm not making this stuff up. <laughs> This isn't me talking, this is God's word talking, okay? I don't want you to ever take my word for it, I want you to see it for yourself. Second reason I want you to bring your Bible is I want you to start to learn how to go through it for yourself. Because the Bible can be kind of intimidating. Like whether you've been going through the word your whole life or, or you've never opened it once, this can be kind of confusing at times. It's a big book, there's, there's some language that's kind of confusing and kind of weird. There's some stories that you read and you're like, I don't know how this necessarily fits together. So I want you to bring it every week and we're going to go through it. I am a huge proponent of taking notes in your Bible, making, making little notes in the margins, highlighting things, underlining things, circling them. If you looked at my Bible, it, it looks like one of my kids got a hold of it with a marker. I, I love going back through my Bible and seeing little notes that I wrote in the margin. I have no idea when I wrote this, but I can go back to it and say, oh, that's what that means. Or that's what God was teaching. Or, or, oh, yeah, I remember why that verse really hit me that time. So bring a Bible with that anticipation every single week. And if you don't have a Bible, come find me. We will take care of you, okay? All right? Well, hey, there's something that's pretty cool to me already about living in Colorado and living by the mountains. And that besides living in Colorado and living by the mountains. But looking at the mountains just can make me feel small. You guys know what that feels like? Like you look right outside our, our building and you see these massive mesmerizing peaks that just automatically make you feel small. And when you think about how big and massive the front range is, that really puts things into perspective. The ocean can have the same effect. I love the ocean, all about the ocean. Love swimming in it, love looking at it, love being around it, I am in. I will admit, though, that uh, Shark Week on Discovery Channel has ruined me. <laughs> every time I'm in the ocean, and I'll still get in, every time, I just think that there's a tiger shark circling me, thinking I'm some helpless seal, and I'm going to be on some video, right? Um, this is actually a really sensitive subject for me, because my family makes fun of me about this all the time, all the time. But whenever I see a shark attack in my newsfeed, you better believe I'm texting it to them right away, because... <laughs> Shark attacks are a real problem, people, so <laughs> y'all can go enjoy spring break. Just go do it. I have no idea why I'm talking about that. Something I love about the ocean. I've gotten a chance to go on a cruise a couple different times, and one of the things that I love to do on a cruise is go up on the top deck and just stare out at the water. 360 degrees of water all the way to, to the horizon. It's incredible, incredibly beautiful, especially at sunset. I love just looking at that deep blue water and the smell. And some of you are with me. You love the ocean. You're all in. You want to go. You'll just look at it. The ocean's great. And then some of you think I'm crazy. I just thinking about the ocean makes you nervous. And, and there's some legitimacy to that fear because the sea can be intimidating, uh, it's big, it's restless, it's raw power. We, we've all seen the videos of 30-foot swells coming up over tops of tankers and tsunamis that are just wiping beaches clean. 
I mean, the sea is powerful. It makes you feel small. It's not to be messed with. And I don't know why I think this, but also whenever I'm looking out over the water and 360 degrees of it, my mind always wonders, what would it be like to be in a little boat out on that water during a storm? I mean, with the waves and the wind, the sound, what would that be like? That would be, that's got to be intense. People in Jesus' day, however, they did not share the same curiosity. Nobody wondered what it would be like to be in a storm. They all hoped they never experienced something like that because the sea, it represented fear. It represented uncertainty. It represented raw power. But there are some guys in Mark chapter 4, they got, they got to experience what a storm was like on the water in the first century. Let's start in verse 35. It says this. As evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, Hey, let's cross to the other side of the lake. So they took Jesus in a boat and started out, leaving the crowds behind. But soon a fierce storm came up. High waves were breaking into the boat, and it began to fill with water. So it says lake here, but this is not some retention pond. It's not a lake that we experience around here. This is the Sea of Galilee. And the Sea of Galilee is a massive body of water. You, you can go there today. It's, it's about 13 miles long and about 8 miles wide. And it actually sits down in a bowl with mountains surrounded all of it. It's 700 feet below sea level. So what can happen is there can be cold air and wind that will come off the tops of the mountains and onto the water. And it will stir up these really violent storms almost out of nowhere. That, that's what's happening right here. Except these guys aren't on some 21st century boat that can take it. They don't have GPS. They don't have a radio that they can call for help. They don't have lifeboats or life jackets. They don't have any of that stuff. Now, they're in some first century rickety fishing boat that somebody did a really poor job with the tar and pitch so it leaks. It already sits low in the water. Now waves are coming up over the sides. I mean, it's four miles on either side of them to shore. Put seven miles in front of them, seven miles behind them. They're not swimming. That's not an option. Like, this is a really bad spot to be in. So what's Jesus doing in all of this? Jesus was sleeping at the back of the boat with his head on a cushion. What? Like, Jesus, I mean, I'm, I'm all for sleeping during a thunderstorm. I love that. But this doesn't seem like the appropriate time to be taking a nap. But for whatever reason, Jesus is calm and relaxed enough to be taking a nap during the storm. Like, that's important to remember. So Jesus was sleeping at the back of the boat with his head on a cushion. The disciples woke him up shouting, teacher, like, don't you care? We're going to drown. I mean, the boat, it's getting, look at this, it's getting tossed back and forth on the waves. Water is pouring in over the sides. Waves are smashing into it. The disciples, they're freaked out. They're screaming, Jesus, wake up. What are you doing? Like, we're, we're going to drown. Don't you care? It's a fair question. These guys are terrified. And that means something because these guys were professional fishermen. They spent their lives on the water. They were used to storms. They'd been through more storms than they could ever remember. But this particular storm's got their attention. It's freaking them out. It's kind of like a firefighter who's scared of a particular fire. You know it's bad. A few years ago, I, I blew up my ankle playing basketball, and when I went to the doctor to get it checked out, the doctor's first reaction when he saw my ankle was, oh, <laughs> it's not the reaction you want from the doctor. That's bad news. I mean, this isn't like you and I getting scared being at sea during a storm. This is the captains from the deadliest catch panicking during a storm. I mean, they think they're going to die. They're convinced they're going to die. Let me push pause on this for just a second, because I don't want us to think that this story is just some evening boat ride that went wrong. Throughout the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, the Bible will compare troubles of life to the perils at sea. It'll compare the storms we face as, as individuals in life with the storms that we'll experience at sea. Psalm 69 which has nothing to do with sailing. It says this, Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I've come into deep waters and the flood sweeps over me. Let not the flood sweep over me or the deep swallow me up. It's saying, God, don't let me drown. Can anybody relate to that song? Where it feels like the waters are just up to your neck. 
I mean, what happened in Mark chapter 4, that literally happened. But that metaphorically happens to every single one of us. Like maybe you feel like you're in a storm right now. Maybe you just, you lost your job. Or you didn't get the job that you interviewed for, the, the job you went to school for. And now you don't know how you're going to pay your mortgage. Student loans kick in next month. You don't know how you're going to pay for those. And it just, it feels like your boat's taking on water. Maybe your marriage isn't good. It just feels like you're getting tossed back and forth on the waves and you have no clue what tomorrow could bring. Maybe you just got a bad diagnosis. And and you just feel like you're getting flooded with fear. Or maybe you were just betrayed by a friend. Or somebody that you, you never thought that that was possible And what it feels like is that somebody just stabbed you in the back and then threw you over the side of the boat. And can anybody relate to that kind of fear or pain or uncertainty or anxiety? Let's just be real for a second. If you have ever, or even right now, if you've ever experienced uncertainty and fear and anxiety and pain, if you've ever been in a storm or you are in one right now, just raise your hand. Keep them up for a second. Now look around the room. That's a lot of storms. Here's what I want you to see with that. You're not alone. In my years of being a pastor, I've gotten to hear some pretty nasty storms to the point now I'm not surprised by anything. What I've also noticed is that many, many times people feel like they're the only one. I'm the only one that's gone through this. I'm the only one that's experiencing this. And let me tell you, that's not true. That's a lie that's meant to make you feel isolated. You're not alone. And you're not alone. And if you know this story, don't fast forward to the end too quickly. Let's sit in this for a second. Storms are scary. They are. It's okay. They're scary. Whenever it feels like the water's up to your neck, it feels hopeless. And things at work aren't going well right now. My marriage isn't good. A friend betrayed me. Doctor's news wasn't good. My finances aren't good. I'm wrestling with with fear and anxiety and depression. Like it just feels like I'm drowning. It feels like the water's up to my neck and I'm not going to make it. That's real. That's how the disciples felt. But in the midst of that, Jesus was still calm enough and relaxed enough to take a nap. And it's not that he's apathetic or not negligent or that Jesus is some jerk. It's just that he had a much different perspective on this storm than we've got. Jesus was sleeping at the back of the boat with his head on a cushion. The disciples woke him up shouting, teacher, don't you care we're going to drown? When Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, silence, be still. Suddenly the wind stopped. And there was a great calm. What was that like? I mean, the disciples are getting battered with water. The wind and the rain feel like needles hitting their face. They're they're grabbing the mast of the ship or anything else that they can get a grip on, holding on for dear life. Then Jesus stands up and yells at the weather. I've yelled at the weather many times in my life. Not done a thing. Jesus stands up, yells at the weather, and it stops. No more wind, no more waves, no more sinking boat, just stillness, just peace. Like you and I weren't there, so this is going to be hard. But try to imagine how dramatic that instantaneous change would have been. To go from the point where you're convinced you're about to die by drowning. And then all of a sudden, there's nothing but stillness. And now there's silence in the boat. The disciples, they're they're wide-eyed with their jaws hanging down, looking at each other like, did that just happen? And then they look over at Jesus. And after a minute, Jesus finally speaks up. He says, "Then then he asked them, why are you afraid? You kidding me, Jesus? Did you not see what just happened? 
Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? The disciples were absolutely terrified. Who is this man, they asked each other. Even the wind and the waves obey him. It's one of my favorite lines in all of scripture. Even the wind and the waves obey him. Circle that, underline it, highlight it, because you're going to need to remember that verse and remind yourself of it when, not if, when you face storms. Because as long as you're alive, storms are an ever-present possibility. Don't ever let somebody tell you that following Jesus means nothing but rainbows and butterflies. That if you follow Jesus, you get a get-out-of-jail-free card when it comes to storms. That is categorically false. When you follow Jesus, there's still going to be storms. It's still going to happen. Peter, one of the disciples who's in the boat, he experienced that storm. Later on in 1 Peter 4, he writes, hey, dear friends, he's talking to us. He says, hey, life bridge, don't be surprised at the fiery trials you are going through. Not if, the ones you are going through, as if something strange were happening to you. Peter's saying, guys, you're not alone. You're not the only ones. It's going to happen. Don't be surprised when storms happen. Not only are they going to happen, but sometimes Jesus will actually lead us into them. Now follow me on this for just a second. I don't know if you're like me, but there have been many times in my life where I have prayed, God, will you just get me out of the storm? Or help me avoid this storm altogether? I don't know if you've been there or not, but God, God, get me out of this mess. And that's okay to pray that. That's okay to ask for that. But when we do pray for that, when we ask for those things, we also need to consider that maybe, just maybe, our perspective on the storm is limited. Now, I'm not, I'm not trying to discount whatever you've been through or what you're going through. Not at all. What I am saying right here is just look at Jesus. If Jesus could control a storm with his voice, then he would know when it was coming in the first place. Think about that. If Jesus had the power to command and control a storm with his voice, then he has to be powerful enough to know it was coming in the first place. Even though Jesus knew the storm was coming in the first place, it was his idea to get in the boat. He led them right into it. When they're standing on the beach, Jesus didn't say, hey, uh, wait a second, guys, let's not get in that boat because there's a class four hurricane coming. Let's take the long way, let's walk it. When they're on the water, he didn't try to avoid it. He didn't yell out, hey, hard to port, there's a squall coming. None of that. He knew it was coming, and he led him right into it. Now, I'm not saying that that every storm that you've ever experienced or the ones that you will experience are caused by Jesus or that he just led you into them. But some of the storms that we face are simply the result of consequences, There's consequences to our actions, good and bad. Like, that's just true. Some storms you will face will be the result of somebody else's sin. Some storms you face are simply because we live in a broken, evil, and fallen world. They're going to happen. But some storms Jesus will lead us into, and when that happens, God cares more about getting you through the storm than getting you out of it. God cares much more about getting you through it than out of it. And maybe you want to push back on that. I do. What do you mean get me through it? I don't want you to get me through it. I want you to get me out of it. I get it. Again, not downplaying what you've been through or what you're going through. And I'm also not saying, hey, just rub some dirt on it. What I am saying is that if God took us out of every storm we face, he'd be robbing us of something that's gold. Because sometimes the greatest opportunity for growth is going through a storm. Sometimes the thing that will draw you closest to Jesus is a storm. And if God just took us out or avoided all the storms in our lives, he'd rob us of that opportunity. Going through a storm is the testing. Getting out of it would be relief. Comfort comes from relief, absolutely. Growth comes from testing. We should care far much more about growth than we do comfort. And I know that is much easier said than done. But when there is a storm going on around outside of you, that might be the best time when God is doing something in you. So here's how God uses them. Here's what happens. Storms can do three things. Number one, storms can build trust. Going through a storm might be the thing that grows your trust in Jesus greater than anything else you will ever experience in life. And remember, Jesus isn't on the shore during this storm. 
He's not standing back on the beach with an umbrella yelling out, hey, you guys got this. Wow, it's really hard. It's coming down pretty hard right now. Go ahead, I believe in you. That's not what he's doing. He's in the middle of the boat. He's in the middle of the storm with them. So since Jesus was right there with them, the worst possible thing the disciples could have done during that storm would have been to jump out of the boat. If somebody would have yelled out, hey, every man for themselves, and they all started hopping over the sides and trying to swim for shore, or grab some driftwood, or swimming to something else, they all would have drowned. They'd all be dead. So whenever you're facing a storm, what is it that you try to swim towards? When you're in a storm, do you, do you swim towards alcohol or substances? Because that seems to numb the storm, at least until the buzz or the high wears off. Do you swim towards porn? Because that makes you feel good for a little bit and forget about things for a while. Do you swim towards Netflix or a hobby or something that in and of itself is a good thing, but you use it as a way to shut your mind off and really just avoid reality instead of facing it? Me personally, when I'm in a storm, the thing I'm tempted to swim towards is isolation. I'm very tempted to isolate myself. And what that is, is just an avoidance mechanism. And in the end, all it does is make me more vulnerable to temptation and less accessible to help. Isolation is a dangerous, dangerous place to be, especially for a leader. What is it that you try to swim towards that you think will make you feel good and safe, but in the end, just accelerates the drowning? Because Jesus is in the boat in the middle of the storm, the worst thing that we can do is jump out of the boat. Don't jump out of the boat, no matter what storm you're in. In the boat, you're also not alone. There were multiple disciples in this boat. That's why coming here every single weekend consistently is huge. More people in your boat. That's why being connected with other Christians through the week is huge. More people in your boat. That's why we don't want you to just attend here. We want you to be connected and a part of the purpose and the mission here. More people in your boat. We grow together. We go through storms together. Storms that you are never meant to face by yourself. Staying in the boat will build that trust in Jesus and it will remind you that you're not alone. And I'm convinced that this is why Jesus took him into the storm in the first place, was just to build trust in him. My brother has a tattoo on his arm that says, smooth seas don't make skillful sailors. What's funny about that is he's in the Air Force. Um, <laughs> I kid you not. And he's going to watch this and then he's going to give me a hard time for saying that, but that's okay. I'm the one that has a microphone right now. But you've probably heard that statement before, right? And there's some truth in that. I mean, storms can sharpen our skills. They can make us better men and women and leaders and friends and disciples and servants. Absolutely. They can, they can get us ready for what's next. But here's the other thing. Number two, storms will also build character. I mean, it takes character to stand in the boat instead of trying to swim to something else. It takes character to stay in the boat instead of swimming towards substances or alcohol or pornography or isolation or whatever it is that we swim to to try to numb ourselves and think that we can save ourselves. It takes character to stand in the boat. I've got young kids, so I'm trying to teach them the value of character. It doesn't matter what we believe. Can, can we just agree for a second that the day and age that we live in, there is a desperate need for character. Would we agree on that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I want my kids to care more about character than they care about charisma. As a church, we want to care more about character than charisma. I'll take character over talent any day of the week and twice on Sunday. Talent's great, but I want them to have character first. Character's going to get them through the storms that they're going to go through in life. They're going to face storms. As their father, of course I want to protect them. That would be the worst thing that I could do. It would be just to shelter them from every single storm that comes their way. So I want to teach them character so they can get through it on their own. Because I'm not going to be there for them every day. Jesus will be, but I won't. I want them to have character to go through storms with other people. As a church, we want to go through storms with other people because that's what Jesus did. 
Storms will build and strengthen your character if you stay in the boat. And here's the third thing that they do. Storms get you ready for what's next. There's two sides of that coin. Funny thing about storms, they keep coming back. Snowstorm after snowstorm. Right? Summer, thunderstorm after thunderstorm. Every fall, there's more hurricanes that hit the Gulf. I'm from the Midwest. Every year, there's more tornadoes. Storms keep coming. And as you go through more storms, they will get you ready for the next one. It doesn't mean it's not going to be easy. It doesn't mean it's going to be pain-free. In fact, the next storm might be harder, but God's building you up for the next one. The positive side of it, since the disciples stayed in the boat, since they went through that storm, the storm that Jesus was in control of, when they went through it and got to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, they got to see Jesus do another miracle. If they would have jumped out of the boat, if they would have avoided it altogether, they would have missed out on that. They wouldn't have got to see him do that. If you stay in the boat, it's going to get you ready for what's next. Storms will get you ready for what's next. I've seen this multiple times in my own life. Storms that I've gone through that have, yeah, sharpened my character, that have built more dependence and trust on Jesus. And I see that God was using it to get me to what was next. I don't have time to go through the details today. I I wish I did, but 2017 was was a massive storm for me. It was, it was not fun. That's the most PG way I can say it. It was hard. It was painful. There were days that I was in tears, and there were days that I wanted to put a hole in the wall when I came home. Hindsight, I can see that God was building a deeper trust in Jesus. I can see that he was sharpening and building my character, and I can see he was getting me ready for what's next. What's next was LifeBridge. If you took me right now and said, all right, we're going to land in December of 2016, and you gave me a choice, Matt, you can either go through the storm that's about to hit, it's going to be hard, you're going to hate it, it's going to be painful, and it's going to last more than a year, or we can fast forward and you can start in the summer of 2018, which would you choose? Without hesitation or question, I would take going through the storm because I can see what God was doing in me. In the moment, I hated it. I wanted to get out of it. I was praying for relief like crazy. But God in his grace has shown me on the backside, here's what I was building in you. Here's what I was sharpening. Here's, what I was, here's where I was humbling you in order to get you ready for what was next. If I would not have gone through that storm, I would not be standing here at LifeBridge today. There's no, no doubt about it. Storms build your trust. They build your character. They get you ready for what's next. So here's the eye-opening truth. You can be in the center of a storm and in the center of God's will. You could be in the center of a storm right now and at the same time in the center of God's will. And maybe you want to push back on that. I don't want to believe that. Yes, I, I want my trust to be built. I want my character to be built. I want to see what God has next. Absolutely. Me personally, a lot of times I don't agree and really want to go with his means and methods of bringing that about. God, I want the character. I want the trust. I want what's next. And I want you to bring that to me while I sit in the proverbial lawn chair on the beach reading my book and you're massaging my neck. But in my 30-some years, he's yet to do it that way. But he says this. Yeah, I'm going to build trust in you. Yes, I'll, I'll build your character. Yes, I'll get you ready for what's next. But the way I'm going to do that is I got to humble you. I got to put you through some storms because that's the best way to build that in you. But don't worry, the whole time I'm going to be in the boat with you. So jumping out of the boat not only would get you further away from Jesus, you'd miss out on the growth and you'd miss out on what's next. So there's two questions that get asked in this story that we got to look at. Jesus asks the first one. He says, do you still not have any faith? I hope you've seen the theme of faith that's woven into this entire series that Rick and I keep bouncing back and forth on. I mean, why is Jesus asking this? Because the disciples did run to him. I mean, that should be our response, is to run to Jesus, whether we're in sunshine or storms. So why the gentle rebuke? I mean, he's not mad at them. He's not coming down on them. But the reason he's asking them is because what drove them to Jesus was not their faith. It was their fear. 
He's like, guys, do you, do you not think I'm big enough? Do you, think I, do you not think I'm powerful enough? Guys, you've seen me heal a paralyzed man. You've seen me feed over 5,000 people with some kids lunchable. You've gotten to see me do incredible things with your own eyes, things that are more miraculous than pigs flying, and yet you still think this storm is bigger than I am? Again, he's not mad at him for being afraid. Fear is a natural response. It's okay to be afraid. But what happened here? The disciples let their fear trump their faith. So whenever you're in a storm, what's greater for you? Is it your fear and the power of the storm? Or your faith in the power of Jesus? Which one's greater? That leads to the second question. The disciples asked it. They said, who is this man? Who is this guy? Who is Jesus to you? Is he some historical figure that says some nice things and did some cool stuff and that's about it? Or is he the one that even the wind and the waves obey? Is is he the one that can be trusted in the middle of the boat? Is he the one that you can run to in faith and not fear? Is he the one that has something on the other side of the storm if you'd stay in the boat? Here's how we respond to storms. When we're in the middle of one, the obvious answer, but we can never sell it short, is prayer. Philippians 4 gives us an example. Starting in verse 6, it says this. This is, the, this is the model for prayer. Don't worry about anything. Don't worry about the storm you're in. Don't worry about the one that's coming on the horizon. Don't worry about the one that you've been in. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. The good, bad, and ugly, pray about everything. Tell God what you need. God, I'm drowning. Man, the water's up to my neck. The waves are coming inside my boat. God, I feel helpless. I don't think I'm going to make it. Here's what I need. Tell him what you need. And then thank him for all he's done. God, I've seen you, through me, I've seen you take me through storms before. God, you've built my character. You've built my trust. You haven't jumped ship. I trust you. I'll follow you. Thank you for that. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus, a.k.a. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you stay in the boat. Worry is a byproduct of fear. Prayer is a byproduct of faith. What's greater for you, your fear in the power of the storm or your faith in the power of Jesus? A great way to determine that answer is to look at what's more dominant in your life. If there's more worry, then fear is dominant. If there's more prayer, then faith is dominant. When you're in a storm, if all you hear is this, hear me say this. When you're in a storm, not if, when, Jesus is there with you. He's got this. He's got it. It doesn't matter what it is. He's got it. Especially when the water feels like it's up to your neck and you can't see forward. He's got it. Trust him. Run to him in faith, not fear. Don't jump out of the boat. Stay in the boat. Let me pray. Father, this is um, this is very easy for me to say. It's much harder to follow. Especially when things are good. Sure, stay in the boat. Yeah, it's great. But when you start getting pounded by waves, that's, that's a lot harder, Father. So I pray that you would speak to our hearts and our minds that we can trust you. That you know what you're doing. That you're not neglecting us or being negligent or that you're asleep at the wheel, but you're calm enough to see what we can't see. God, you are an infinite and I'm 37. You have a much better perspective than I do. Help us trust your infinites. I also ask right now, God, that you would give us the grace, every single one of us in this room, you would give us the grace and the gift right now that we could look back on every storm that we've gone through in our life and you would reveal to us today what you were doing in us when everything was a mess around us. 
Let us see what you were building in us. Let us see how you got us to what was next. And then strengthen our faith and trust with that. And I pray that you would give us a heart of gratitude and thankfulness for the storms that we've gotten to go through. Change our minds and our perspectives to be thankful for that. God, I need that. Thank you for being no less than God. Thank you for being the one that even the wind and the waves obey, but will follow you. In Jesus' name, amen.